This ESPN podcast is brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit GEICO.com. The Pirates and Cardinals have the best two records in baseball, and they go head-to-head one final time this regular season. Could this be a preview of next week's division series? Coverage begins Wednesday at 6.30 Eastern on ESPN Radio. Opinion must hear radio. This is the Paul Feinbaum Show. And now, Paul Feinbaum. I sincerely hope you're not just putting on the program, whether you're getting in your car listening to us on the radio or flipping it on at home or somewhere else on television or maybe watching us on the uh, Watch ESPN app. We've had an amazing show. Dak Prescott started us off and impossible not to admire him. I realize maybe there's a couple of detractors out there in Oxford, but uh, the majority of the people uh, around this league and around the country love this young man. He was fantastic in our segment with him. We uh, talked to Trevor Maddich, who defended Butch Jones on the one point versus the two points on the uh, play at the end of near, or near the end of the Florida game in the Swamp. Seth Emerson on the scene in Athens. Ben Cohn from the Wall Street Journal on why college football games seem to last so long. We have uh, not heard from many Auburn fans since the epic collapse. Uh, no Tammy this week. No Charles from Realtown. No I Man. Well, correction. I Man is next. Good afternoon. <laughs> no, I mean, live from the capital city. Always live from the capital city, win, lose, or draw. <clears throat> you know, Paul, I hear a lot of Auburn fans say, it's just not fun to watch Auburn football. I hear your analysts say, you know, they're not fun. I had them going to the national championship. Boy, was I wrong, but let me jump off that ship now. I love you when your analysts are wrong, because, you know, they break down film and they study so hard, and you know they are the consummate professionals, although they look like the constipated unprofessionals. But, you know, Paul, I find it interesting that the, the Wall Street Journal would write an article about the length of a football game. If you go to producing these games to fit your time schedule, aren't you taking the reality out of it and the natural and the norm, and now you're producing it to fit your time frame when your time frame is built on selling commercials? Would you agree? Well, the the issue that I think a lot of uh, networks have, uh, and only one is in the position of ESPN, that you, you most of the games are slotted for about a three and a half hour period, and when they go long, you have to find some place to put them. ESPN has multiple networks; they can put a game on ESPN News, ESPN U, ESPN Two, the SEC Network, wherever uh, until the next one starts. But if you, you know, the other ones don't have that luxury. Where is ESPN and the big boy network of all these big guys? Maybe their professionals are underestimating as well. So there's a lot of, where they get all these geeks coming in here changing everything and trying to assume this is how long it should last because we got to watch The Voice. We got to watch The Voice. That boy from Slap Out's on. I'm, my God, where is that boy from Slap Out? I'm mad as hell and I ain't taking it no more. But I find that interesting. And then, you know, Paul, can I be real honest with you? Because know, you know I love this show better than anybody. And I understand y'all going, you know, to the situations that you go to, the campuses on Friday, you're interviewing everybody, you get some calls in. But you know what I miss most? I miss most Monday when the callers call in and are whining and moaning and groaning and celebrating, and the callers don't get to uh, to speak as much because you did not write a book about ESPN analysts. You wrote a book about callers, and and you sold this show on callers. And I love all your analysts, 
But I think that whoever's producing this thing is overproducing this. We are not Phil Collins. We are Rod Stewart and the Faces, and we are raw. And that's what the country loved was raw emotion. And now it seems so staged. And, you know, it's like having a bad bass player and a drummer. They just aren't connecting. I want my bass player back, Paul. I've been your drummer for 15 years, and I'm mad as hell, and I want the other bass player back now. War Eagle. They were, they were telling me to cut him, but I, I said we have, to, we have to listen. The bass player, of course. Let's uh, continue with more calls. And J.D. is in Daytona. How are you, J.D.? All right. How you doing, Paul? Okay. Hey, I just wanted to tell you that uh, I think it's fantastic. SEC Network, saw the Big Ten Network come out. <clears throat> That's how ESPN got started everything. A couple people gave me some advice along my way. A former ball player uh, played it in the SEC. I'll stay anonymous. I just want to tell you it's a beautiful thing you guys got going here. Um, one thing is uh, empty barrels make the most noise. And uh, you can't win an argument with an ignorant person. I love your discernment. Uh, keep it going. I love the SEC Network. Love you guys. Thank you very Have much. Nice to, we've had two callers, and one loves us, and one wants to go backwards. What can we do? We try. Let's uh, grab some more calls. And uh, Mookie, I always like it when a Mookie calls. Hey, Mookie. Hey, Mr. Feinbaum. How you doing? I'm doing great. Man, I, I, I certainly appreciate you taking my call. I've been watching you for a long, long time. I was listening to you when you was down in Birmingham. Well, thank you very much. And I, I, I just want to kind of, kind of touch base on, on Heath's call a little bit. And I, I think that he had some sort of point. But, you know, I'm an SEC fan. I'm not an Auburn fan. I'm not a Tennessee fan. I'm not an Alabama fan. But I tell you what, sometimes we just beat each other up. And we got to stop that. How do you expect us to get some positive exposure when we're constantly putting each other down? Well, Mookie, that's the nature of fan bases. Uh, that's what makes it a, a great sport. Uh, you, you root for one team, you root against the other. I'm, I'm not trying to bring detente or peace or diplomacy to this program. I think most fan bases know the limits and the boundaries. Very few go over the line. A few do occasionally, and they poison trees. Brooks is up next. Uh, how are you, Brooks? Good afternoon. Hey, what's up? <clears throat> I hope you're doing well today, man. I'm not a Alabama or a Auburn fan or a Tennessee fan, but I am a Gator fan, and uh, I'd like to talk about the uh, game this past go right weekend. ahead. I, I heard your show yesterday, man, and, uh, you know, I agree that Butch Jones peed the bed a little bit. Um, uh, from a Tennessee's perspective, but it didn't sound like to me nobody was giving Florida any hardly any credit, you know. And uh and trying to make it sound like Tennessee gave us the game. And uh there was only one turnover for Tennessee, one turnover for Florida and uh, I don't believe Tennessee gave us those five five for five fourth down conversions. Um, you know, I mean we had to go make those plays and we did it. I mean we got a and we were fortunate to win. And I've been saying all along Butch Jones is he's uh very overrated as a coach. He's a great recruiter to me in my opinion, but Man, uh, the Gators, man, we, we're we not backed by any means, and um, but uh, we do have a defense, and our defense actually didn't even play that well. We missed so many tackles, but yet we still found a way to make it 11 in a row against those balls. So I hope all those Tennessee fans out there ain't, ain't doing too ain't doing too bad today. And I know you're a Tennessee grad, Paul, but, and you did look good in that Gator jersey. jersey <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I, I had uh, fun uh, trying to get into the Gator jersey yesterday for those who... Missed it. Uh, some guy called in last week, said if you, I, I was arguing, I said I thought Tennessee was going to win the game. And he said, uh, he asked me, if, he said, would you put a Gator jersey on? I said, yep, sure will. Didn't think I'd have to do it. Did it. Guess what? I'm back today. Appreciate the call. Let's uh, continue with more phone calls. And Paul in Georgia is up next. Hey, Paul. Hey, Paul. This is the first time getting through this year. I wanted to give you my perspective on why Georgia and Alabama aren't jumping in each other's throats right now. I mean, Normally, you're going to have your rabid fans that want their 15 minutes, their video, their rant, and we like them, we laugh at them because we, you know, they make us laugh and they make us realize we're not so bad after all. But for me, the Bama fans aren't as obnoxious as, let's say, Auburn or Florida fans. Uh, I don't personally even think back to the blackout game. I don't think back to the championship game we lost because a long time ago, different players. I think it boils down to the fact it's like the kids are going to meet at recess to fight. And one of them scared, and the other one's glad of it. 
That's the way I feel. We both think we're going to win, but we're pretty scared we can lose, too. Yeah, I, I think you're right, uh, Paul. It's interesting. Uh, when you think about Georgia's biggest rivals, Auburn is among them, same for Alabama. And I, I just don't think there's a natural hate between these two schools. They're among the best in the SEC year in, year out. Uh, and we they, have a little bit better class than some of these other schools. Well. I'm sorry to say it. <laughs> I haven't had an Alabama boy marry into our family this year, so we're kind of keeping the trash talk down. But we, there's still a bit of respect, I think that's a better thing term to say, between the two schools' fans. We're not as, like I said, noxious like an Auburn fan or a Florida fan. You know, and, 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 we, and Georgia fans, we've been here before. We, we, we've been through this. Well, we're going to win this game, and then we get let so down. So we're kind of apprehensive as well and now Auburn I mean Alabama now is all of a sudden whoops we've well, lost. Paul, I tell you what I think I, I think there's a quiet confidence uh, from Georgia fans and maybe when I get to Athens I'll have a better feel Alabama fans I'm not sure know what's going on uh, there, there's a lot of doubt among Alabama fans yeah I mean you get the the usual callers uh, this the uh, the serial callers who always say the same thing every time, whether Alabama wins or not. But but realistic Alabama fans are concerned, and they should be concerned because this program had it going two years ago. It was marching toward another national championship. Last year they got back in it, then they got steamrolled by Ohio State. This year no one knows what to believe. And I think that's why this game is so important. It's also why Alabama fans are keeping their mouths shut for the most part because they know how devastating it will be to suffer another loss by the first weekend in October. Thanks for the call. Really do appreciate it. Mark is in Dallas, Texas. Hey, Mark, good afternoon. Hey, Mr. Feinbaum, how are you? I'm very well. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Uh, I think your uh, knowledge of college football is second to no one. Uh, I wanted to speak about the uh, Alabama-Georgia game. Uh, I, I think he has a point as far as the fans go on why everybody's so quiet. But I think if I were Georgia, I would rather play an undefeated Alabama team than, a, than one that, with one loss. Uh, I think Alabama's going to come in there and take Georgia down. I really do. You know, I agree with you, uh, Mark, in, in, in one respect. And, and I, I, maybe when it's over, I'll be able to understand my, my gut instinct here more. But, but for some reason, the Alabama loss has upset the dynamics of this game. And I, I think it seems to be affecting both schools. Which one? I mean, listen, that's not going to affect the actual game. What I'm talking about is it's, it's affecting the buildup a little bit. And in some strange way, this is a, a Tuesday prediction. Could could change by Wednesday, but but I think it's it's favoring Alabama a little bit. We'll take a short break. Eight five five two four two seven two eight five. That's where we are as we roll into uh, the second half of the program. Love to hear from you. We just got criticized for not taking calls. What are we doing? And by the way, Lance did not get in yesterday. He's been telling us that Florida is back. He'll come up in the next segment. individuals program is Chris Felica from College Game Day got a great opportunity to uh, be around him all the time a couple of years ago and uh, hardly hard to find it's impossible to find a more knowledgeable person on the sport. Chris Felica joins us and Chris thanks for the time as always and uh, you don't need to hype Alabama Georgia but uh, I saw one of your notes and you asked a question earlier this week is this the biggest game for Nick Saban at Alabama he's won four national championships he's been in contention every year but uh, it is important because if Alabama loses it could mark the beginning of the end uh, fair statement yeah I, I think I think it's a fair statement but also keep in mind that uh, if you look at the Alabama roster, I think the one thing that people agree on is missing is a quarterback. And they have two very young, highly touted guys that uh, maybe by next year, certainly the year after, they'll be ready to play. 
And uh, I, I think marking the end of the dynasty, I, I think it might be a little premature to say that, given that uh, if you think only one thing is lacking, you've got a couple of young guys on the roster that you think are going to develop. Uh, I, I think it's a little too early to throw uh, dirt on the, uh, the Alabama team. <laughs> You are you are uh, money when it comes to predictions. I believe I saw something. You've been twenty and five this year on, on calls. So uh, when you when you look at the Alabama Georgia game, uh, what do you look for? I mean, we know the quarterback situation, but if you're trying to handicap that game, where do you go? I, I think there are a couple things that I'm looking at is out just Alabama. The turnover margins, obviously, negative thirteen in the last six losses. But I'm also hesitant on just anointing Grayson Lambert in Georgia. Uh, just because they ripped apart an awful South Carolina defense. I mean, they wanted to the struggle against Vandy, and the Vandy defense turned out to be okay. Uh, they gave all Miss a, uh, a game there for a while, but it just, the game just kind of feels like it has one of those been there, done that kind of games. I mean, the last seven times Georgia has taken on a top 15 power five slash AQ opponent when they were the higher ranked team, they've lost six of them. And then the last time, nine times Alabama entered the game as a lower ranked team, they won seven of them. So, I mean, I think it's a perfect spot. I know Alabama would love to be undefeated and be number one and number two in the country, but I think it's a really good uh, spot for Nick Saban and Alabama to potentially go in there as an underdog. We, we, we really, we, I mean, people have just written them off already. That dynasty's over, the season's over, the run's over. It's really a great, if you can't be undefeated, you couldn't ask for a better spot as an Alabama fan to be going in there with very little pressure. I, I'm with you. I think the pressure is all on Georgia this year. And, and I've, I've made this argument uh, all week, Chris, and, and, I, and I, as I as I say it, I'm finding myself going, what am I saying? Because it almost seems contradictory. Uh, but let me ask you to explain a little bit more. Let, let's forget what happened in, at Brian Denny Stadium two weeks ago. What if Alabama had pulled that game out, just for the sake of argument? What do you think, or how do you think the dynamics of this game would have been different? I think Alabama would be a favorite in the game, and I think it would be a chance for Georgia to knock off an undefeated team as a, as a, as a lower-ranked team, as a home underdog, and announce their arrival as a, the team to be in the SEC. So I, I, think, I think the result of Brian Denny a couple of weeks ago completely flipped uh, the perception and the outcome of the game. Ole Miss at Florida. Uh, you'll see Tim Tebow's speech a couple of times this weekend, I'm <laughs> sure. Uh, it, was a, it was an amazing game during uh, Urban Meyer's championship season. What intrigues you the most as the Rebels head to the Swamp Saturday night? It was interesting to see Florida crack the top 25 this week, and really the only reason they're ranked is because of Tennessee's mismanagement of the final 10 minutes of that game. But I think this game has one of the biggest potential mismatches of the weekend in terms of the Ole Miss defensive line versus the Florida offensive line. I mean, you look at the teams that Florida has played thus far, uh, the defenses they played. New Mexico State's 127 in defense. East Carolina's 106. Kentucky's 83rd, Tennessee's 44th. But despite all those terrible defenses they played, Florida's not even a top 50 offense in terms of efficiency. I think the Ole Miss defensive line is going to dominate the game. The Rebels got the wake-up call last week when they skirt around with Vandy for a little while. Two non-conference games the next couple of weeks for, for, uh, for Ole Miss before they get back into SEC play. The Gators are going to have the Rebels full attention. They got the wake-up call last week, and I think Ole Miss goes on the road to get the big one. Ohio State at Indiana. I know uh, the boys in Bloomington tried to get game day there. I don't think they had much of a shot, but uh, they definitely blew up Lee Fitting's Twitter feed, which isn't a bad idea, by the way, to, to do yeah, that. I, we all encourage that. Anything, anything <laughs> negative and anything you want to say to Mr. Fitting, have at it. At least said it. He's there. No, I, I agree with you. I, I, I send him hate mail every week. Uh, but Ohio State has just become the, the Florida State of last year. They're, they're difficult to watch. They're not playing well. This was the team anointed five weeks ago as, as an, almost an automatic. What's going on? Well, I think they, uh, Urban Barr even addressed that last week, saying he, just, he thinks that everyone's kind of feeling the pressure and living up to the hype and the expectations and uh, with that bullseye on, on their back right now. But I think this is probably as close to a, a wake-up or a bullseye-type game where Ohio State will play well. Being, yes, Indiana's 4-0, but yeah, they're like 56 or 65 Power 5 teams in terms of the FBI power rating. They're really not a very good team. It's a team that has really struggled against FIU and Wake Forest, give it up a ton of points. Uh, I think this is a really good chance for Ohio State to go on the road, get away from home, focus. We saw them in the in, in the road game against Virginia Tech opening night of the year where they played their best football. And I think uh, I, I'd be very surprised if this were uh, anything more than a three or four touchdown win for Ohio State. We had Dak Prescott on earlier. Certainly uh, this is a better game than I think most of us thought it would be, but 
Something tells me you're not buying heavily into this one. Mississippi State at Texas A&M. No, I'm totally with you. This is a really intriguing game to me because while I don't think the Mississippi State uh, offense is, is going to generate a ton of points, their defense is very good. Uh, oh, by the way, I'd like to give my triple not so fast Mississippi State over Auburn pop. Uh, one, little, <laughs> one little run again uh, last week. Uh, guys, I'm, guys, I'm such to pick those upsets every now and then. But this is a really dangerous spot for Texas A&M. Off, final game before the Alabama game. This is the game last year against Mississippi State where the wheels really came off for the Aggies after that great start. Uh, escaped together. That was a great game against Arkansas the other night. It, it never really felt like A&M was in control or had a chance to win the game, but finally getting the ball back late after Arkansas played a great game at Keyboard the entire night. Uh, the Aggies made some plays. I, I like A&M to win the game, but I think this is going to be another really tough, uh, close game because the Mississippi State defense, I think, will give A&M some problems. I saw your, your tweet as uh, Butch Jones went for one against Florida, <laughs> and I'm, am I going, he, he, I wonder if Chris Felica is going to turn out to be a prophet on this like uh, he would be later in the evening, and guess what? Hello, Mr. Prophet. What's ah. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, was, uh, it was one of those things where I, I know it's easy, easy to second guess, but everyone, a lot of people saw it. If, if you go for two and you miss, you're up 26-14, and you're in the same 26-14, 27-14, they're the same thing at that point in the game. If you lose 28-26, at least you can say, you know what, we, we figured we needed to go for two in case, and uh, we didn't get it. But 28-27 was really a boil. And I feel really bad for the Tennessee players and Tennessee fans because uh, they were there, what, they what, opponents now, what, 9-10 on fourth down this year. Oklahoma scored a touchdown on fourth down. Florida scored a touchdown on fourth down. Uh, given the loss there. I mean, they're really, really close to being a top-12 team. Uh, and undefeated right now. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't write the balls off for the rest of the year because they have a ton of talent. And, and that's another game this week between the two ways that Tennessee lost week, lost last week, the way Arkansas lost last week. That's going to be a really intriguing game to see which team can can bounce back off of that loss quicker. Let me uh, go back to something we talked about a minute ago, and, and that's Auburn. I realize they're off the radar grid this week, but. Uh, we talked a lot about Oregon falling from grace, and I want to get your thoughts on that. But but Auburn and Oregon, to me, uh, they played for the championship a couple of years ago, uh, they, and Auburn won in 2010, and Auburn played and lost, and Oregon played and lost. What's going on with these two programs? Well, Oregon really concerned me entering this year because I, th I think there were questions, and a lot of people even raised them last year, like, okay, Marcus Mariota is going to be gone after this year. What is the long-term prognosis for the Oregon program, because I think people thought, okay, Chip is gone, Marcus is still there for a couple of years, he's good enough to, to cover up a lot of the concerns that they have, and now you have no Chip, you have no Marcus, and if you look back defensively especially, when they played for the national title against Auburn in 2010, they were second in the country in defensive efficiency. Nick Aliotti's final year, they were, I think, 15th or 16th in defense. Last year, without Alioli for the first time, they fell into the low 30s, I think 36th or something like that. And entering last week, they were 82nd, which now they're outside the top 100. So there were a lot of worries about that Oregon defense, especially on my part, uh, entering the year. And I never, never in a million years thought that Utah would have been the offense to completely expose them, but they were. And it certainly looks like the Ducks have a few more losses on their on their slate upcoming for the rest of the year in Auburn. And what is it with the second year after playing for a national title for, for the Tigers? I mean, after 2010, 2012 was one of the worst years in SEC history, and now two years after 2013, it looks like they're uh, headed for another rough. I, don't, I saw the guys talk that schedule uh, yesterday about how many SEC games they're going to win, and uh, will they finish 6-6? Six and six? I, I, don't, I don't know if 6-6 six and six is possible. I, I just don't see who they're going to beat late in the year in the SEC. Chris Felica, College Game Day, live in Clemson for the Notre Dame matchup. Uh, Clemson, a site you guys have been to a few times in the past. Well, we appreciate it, Chris. Talk to us talk next week. Can't wait to do Anytime, it. Anytime, Paul. Take care. What a segment. Chris Felica, one of the best around, breaking down some games. He has a 20-5 and five record. That's money in the bank. We'll take a short break. 855-242-7285. Many more calls as we continue here in the third hour on a Tuesday. Schneider is.
welcome you back uh, to the program. And uh, we're talking about Auburn during the break. Gus Malzahn uh, has had plenty to say about what lies ahead. You're always curious about how one of your players are going to respond the first time they play college football and the first snap that they take, and more importantly, when they're a quarterback. And so, you know, pregame, I really watched him close. Um, you know, you could tell the moment wasn't too big for him then. He didn't have that a bright-eyed look, you know, like he was scared or anything like that. And then right before he went out the first drive, you could tell that he was just ready to go and just needed to get hit once. And, you know, I felt like that first drive with with a new quarterback, I felt like, you know, he did some very good things. I mean, he got a little pressure one time, made a throw down the field, and, uh, you know, did some good things. So there's a lot of things he can uh, build upon uh, with him, and I uh, think he'll get nothing but better with experience. Is that going to be a week-to-week thing with the naming a starting quarterback? Or well, you know, right now where we're at, um, you know, he did a good good job for us. Uh, we feel like he's going to get better. Uh, he's our starting quarterback this week, and we really feel like he's got a chance to to be a very good quarterback in our system. And, and so, uh, you know, we're just going to take it like that. And Sean White uh, named uh, the starter this weekend. Uh, that didn't surprise really anyone. Let's uh, get back to the calls. And Daryl is next up in Georgia. Hey, Daryl. Well, I think that is pretty much officially the stolen in power right there. I mean, wouldn't you say? They, 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 okay, Gus, we understand that, okay? But but what you, what you tend to forget is you are a spread offense. That, that is what you've implemented there. He is a pocket passer. I mean, I, I, I just, I don't, I don't get it. Let me ask you something. When you say that somewhere along the lines, Jay Jacobs has to be equally responsible, wasn't, wasn't he the one that did Jet Gate on, on Tommy Tupperville? Well, he, uh, no, he, he was not. Uh, David Housel was the athletic director. Okay, okay, a different one, okay. It's just, I mean, but, but, okay, they, they had consistency with Tuberville. I will, I will give all of that. At least they had consistency. Ever since then, Chizik, no consistency. Well, but, no, but hold on a second, Daryl. Uh, I mean, here, here's where it gets interesting with Auburn. I mean, Chizik and, and Malzahn have been all over the map. The, they both have played for national championships. But I'm wondering, though, if, if that hasn't been the outlier. I mean, Chizik clearly lost control of the program. He lost his job. The, the real question is, what is Gus Malzahn going to do to get this back? Because until two or three weeks ago, he had as good a reputation as anyone in the country. And, and even though last season collapsed and Auburn went eight and five, it was like no one cared. I mean, you you, you listen to this show, Darrell. Every Auburn fan was so confident that Auburn was back, regardless of the way the season ended. Auburn has now lost five consecutive SEC games. They're the first team, in, it has to be the first team in college football history to be ranked in the top five and l- lose their first game and fall out of the rankings. I mean, un- un- unbelievable. I, just, I still can't believe it. And, and, and you're right. I mean, to put all, this is, but here's the deal. You've got to stick with that quarterback, man. I mean, you've got to. You got to just don't, unless he's hurt. If he's injured or something like that, then I can understand that. But, but if that's not the case, I just not, I, I don't get it. I, especially with all the hype. I mean, there's no, maybe he's got some kids he's got to work out, but just the benching, to go with a, with a, with a red shirt freshman, I mean, I would be questioning that big time. I mean, that, 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 I mean, that only makes sense to me. I mean, just, you, you're paying you millions of dollars, and that's the best decisions that you can make. I mean, that's, it's, it's ridiculous. Paul, okay, I'm going to break down the Georgia Alabama game. Well, first let me say this, okay? I want to send props out to my man, Ben Flanagan. I, 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 I appreciate him still throwing props out for me. I don't know what ESPN is waiting for. I mean, they, there's a great rider right there. They, they like they like quality people. There's so, one right did there. You say, did you say uh, Did you say Ben Flanagan? Yes, Ben Flanagan. Yeah, L. dot com. He wrote a great piece yesterday, uh, breaking down this show. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I thought it was great. They need to be working for ESPN. You know, I don't know why they haven't offered him a job. You know, what I'm saying the guy. I love his articles. Real good, especially when he writes about me. You know, but hey, I'm going to break down to George. I, I heard Jerome come in here. Both his guns. You know, I remember Jerome was also the one that said, uh, if you remember, old, when Ole Miss beat Alabama last year, oh, that was their national championship game. <laughs> so what did Ole Miss do? Turn around and beat them again. Turn around and I guess they won that national championship game this time, though, right? I mean, good Lord. But let's break it down, okay? Quarterback, Georgia has to have the edge. Running back, Georgia has to have the edge. Wide receivers, Georgia has to have the edge. Offensive line, 
Georgia has the edge. I'll call it even on the defensive line. I'm giving Georgia the advantage in the secondary, and I'm giving Georgia the advantage in special teams. And what I don't understand is all of your number one recruit classes. How is that? I mean, how did it turn out to be that way? But, um, you know, what's that about? They, they won last week, Paul, and they dropped in the polls. The dynasty is over. It was never a dynasty anyway. Paul, when you win a championship and next year you don't win, and then you win a championship and you win a championship, and the next two years you don't win a championship, that's not a dynasty. Not a, a dynasty doesn't have hiccups in it. A dynasty is consecutive winning like, like UCLA did in the 70s in basketball. So, I mean, and, 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 and yet there's a little bad blood in here. Remember the shot dial to the Lerma? We haven't forgotten about that. We had, this might have been three years ago. This might be a different football team, but we still haven't forgotten about that. Come Saturday, between the hedges, we, I mean, I cannot wait. We're going to lay the smack down on that Alabama Crimson Tide, Rudy Pooh. See you, Paul. Thank you very much. And Darrell, obviously, uh, okay, we've been waiting for this call, and uh, I thought about this uh, Saturday night when <laughs> Florida went and put, uh, put the uh, final nail in the coffin. Lance is next. Good afternoon, Lance. Oh, Paul, I don't want to hear the comment about how Tennessee lost the game. I don't want to hear all this bull crap about Bush Jones. I've been telling you all summer long about Bush Jones. He's a show card. He ain't stacking nothing but bricks in the loft column. And you keep talking, all you want to do is that like his coping season cost from the game. You want to ignore that fumble that your boy Josh Doss, the superstore, gave up. That's what put us back in the game, Paul. He, but nobody wants to talk about that because everybody wants to hate on uh, Bush Jones. Well, I already knew about Bush Jones. Tell me something I don't know, Paul. Genius. And you want to talk about that top five recruiting class? How about that little freshman, Tony L. Callaway? I think he had a bigger impact on the game than any player in them top two five recruiting classes put Jones put together. And you know why I got them, huh? Volunteers. But hey, Paul, tell me this. I told you, Bush Jones wasn't a special coach. You laughed at me and told me he was. Now, come on. When are you going to give me some love on the show? Quick, well, 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 listen, I don't know what else to do. Uh, uh, Lance, Lance, I don't know what else to do, but uh, I introduced you. I mean, I give you credit. Uh, what do you want me to do, jump up and down? Uh, I, want you, I, want you, I want you to talk about Will Greer and Florida in a respectable manner, Paul, because all I said about Florida is they could win five conference games, and you said, what makes you think they're going to be so Lance, safe? Well, well, let me say that. I mean, I, I am incredibly impressed with what I've seen so far from Florida. Uh, I didn't expect them. I mean, I thought they'd have one loss. I thought that loss would be Tennessee. I, I did think they'd get by Kentucky. Uh, I think they have a difficult road ahead. I, I don't see them winning I do too. the next I do couple too. of weeks, but I've been wrong I before. I think they can beat Missouri. Like every week on this I think they can show. beat Missouri. And who knows about this week? I like the way Coach Mack is going this week. He's already talking about how uh, uh, Ole Miss don't got no regard for Florida. And like you said, we should go in here and get our butts kicked. So what's... Go in here and have some fun. I think it'll take a little pressure off a little bit. He's obviously felt a little pressure these last two weeks. I mean, he's missed a lot of easy throws. But once his feet get settled in, he won't have to make fourth quarter comebacks. Mm -hmm. And I try to tell you all along, and all y'all want to talk about was Jeremy Johnson. I told you, he did a first half against Arkansas, one of the worst defenses ever, and y'all want to praise him up, but I can't get no optimism for Will Greer. And you want to talk about Brad Bielema. I told you that punk was in over his head, and he won't never win in the SEC. You saw me, I was crazy, wait and see. We ain't got to wait and see, Pop. Some things I just know. Pay attention, son. Go do this. Appreciate the call. Always a pleasure. Doc is up next in Charlotte. Good afternoon, Doc. How you doing, Paul? Uh, enjoying the show this week, the bits and pieces I've heard. Um, what, I'm not sure if it's been mentioned, but uh, I don't, and I don't really know how much anyone cares about Texas anymore. But just because they have gotten a lot of talk on the show in the past, the, the end of that game, I just happened to be. Yeah, watching yeah listen, it. I, I've, was, I have, uh, I've had my doubts. Uh, I've been saying this now for a couple of years about whether Charlie Strong would make it out there, but I'm now to the point where I, I genuinely feel sorry for the guy. He made some big mistakes in that game, but. That program should be better off than, than it, it, it is right now. I mean, I've, I've never seen a yeah, program I'm, lose games like this. Yeah, I just happened to catch by the last seven or eight minutes of the game, and it was just, I mean, it wasn't even comical. It was just like, how how is this? I just don't even understand how the end of that game transpired. I mean, I have never, I don't remember the last time I saw a team just give a game away like that. I know they're not any 
it's hard to say they gave a game away because they're not that good, but just the end of that game was, it is worth mentioning on this show that, you know, we can rip Auburn and, you know, a lot of other teams who have looked bad this year, but, I mean, that for a major college program with, you know, a coach getting paid, I don't know, $5 million a year with million-dollar coordinators, I mean, if I was a, a Texas fan, I just I wouldn't even know... I wouldn't even know whether to laugh or cry, but I, I just wanted to see what you thought about hey, that. Hey, Doc, hey, I hate to run. We're up against a break, but I really do appreciate your call. Still plenty of time for you to get in. A couple of guests in the final hour, including Laura Rutledge. We'll also go to College Station, find out about the Aggies. We talked to Dak Prescott many hours ago. Enjoyed that very much. We'll be right back. Stick around. <laughs> Back to the program. Glad everyone on board and uh, more phone calls at 855 242 7285. Let's uh, check in with Roger in Tennessee. Uh, hey, Roger. Hi, Paul. I'm in North Carolina. North Carolina, yeah. I looked down and saw Asheville. I didn't think I, I, I knew I've been to Asheville, North Carolina. I've never been to Asheville, Tennessee. Well, thank you for the phone call. Yeah, I hadn't talked to you in a while. I want to get caught up on the length of college football games. And I'll make this real short. I was fortunate enough on ESPN Radio this past Sunday morning to catch the Darian Mel show, or at least part of it. Mm -hmm. And Mel Kuyper went on a rant about the length of college football games that he got a standing ovation out of me with the timeouts and the length of halftime and the official reviews of plays to, oh, get it right, which I've gotten sick and tired of. So I'll close with this comment. The next time you're watching a college football game, bring an assistant with you to count the number of times that the, during the game, the play clock is moving and the game clock is not moving. And then we'll understand why a game like Alabama and Tennessee plays four hours to play, and as always, the Eastern time zone gets through. Paul's, I love your show. I'm just getting really ticked off about the state of college football, and I welcome your comments. Yeah, Roger, I agree. Um, I remember having a conversation with Mike Slide, uh, the commissioner at the time of the SEC, and, and they were working hard on, 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 on these issues, and when the review came in, uh, they worked even harder because it, it did lengthen the game. I, I know everyone's in on this, but uh, you know, sometimes uh, you, the combination of television uh, up tempo, it, it just it, it reviews. It, it's just, it's ridiculous. And, and frankly, on television, there's a big difference. You watch a game on television, and you can flip the channel. Uh, you most of the time there are two or three other games going on, maybe more. Sitting at the game is painful. You're just sitting there going, "Is this game ever going to restart?" Thank you very much for the call. Peter is uh, next up in Jacksonville. Hey, Peter. Hey, what's going on? This is Peter Paul, Paul, the Gator Man. You got it. And I, I want to yeah, let you know, and this is not too hard, but Paul, listen, brother, I have forgotten more football than most guys know. Next week, this I mean, this Saturday, 7 o'clock in Gainesville, you know what? I want every woman, man, boy, and child to sit down. We're going to shock the crowd again. Everybody in Oxford, Mississippi will be sucking on lemons that night. I tell you, brother, the state of Florida, you know, Alabama, you should thank us. I sent you Amari Cooper. I sent you Derrick Henry. LSU, I sent you a good cornerback in Tolliver. And I tell you, I want to help Charlie Strong. If you want to win in Charlie Strong, you got to recruit in Florida. You know, they make these movies, Texas Highlight, I mean, Friday Night Lights. The best football players in the high school, ladies and gentlemen, are in the Sunshine State, from Muscambia to Key West. We can make our own movie football icons. And I tell you what, I tell you all what, you don't think, you, you, every game, Florida's getting to buy into the winning. That game against Tennessee, there wasn't a tip ball, there wasn't a bad officiating call like the Ohio State Miami game. We took what we wanted from them, like the men of Sparta. I'm going to tell you something, Paul Feinbaum. If I tell you if it's getting too tobacco, you look for stuff between his teeth. In the state of Florida, 
we are the strongest thirds of the SEC. And we're the state of the union in Florida high school football. And as the nature boy would say, to be the best, you got to beat the best. Go Gators! Woo! Wow. Look at, what an original call. I mean, you just have one of the big wins, uh, the comeback story from Jim McElwain, and that's the best you can do? Man. I think I made Lance look good. That's taking something. We're three hours down. Look forward to uh, one more hour to go. Stick around. Hi, I'm Football's Back, and it already feels like the playoffs thanks to One Week Fantasy at DraftKings.com. With millions of dollars in prizes being paid out each week, every play in every game could take you closer to a life-changing payday. Hurry to DraftKings.com now. Use promo code FINE and play for free with your first deposit in this Sunday's $1 million fantasy contest. This isn't fantasy as usual. This is DraftKings. Welcome to the big time. Enter FINE for free entry now only at DraftKings.com. That's DraftKings.com. Com. Hey college football fans, I'm Adam Rittenberg. Everybody likes to bury contenders early in the season, but whose title hopes have the best chance of being resurrected? We'll get into that on the latest Championship Drive podcast. Come check it out at ESPN.com slash podcenter. Last week, Julie Carroll posted a status that read, Just had the most delicious banana ever. It got two likes and four comments. Well, Julie Geico also wants to make a comment. What if we told you in as little as 15 minutes you could save hundreds of dollars on your car insurance by switching to Geico? With those hundreds of dollars, we bet you can find another banana equally, if not more delicious, than the one you had last week. Hashtag go bananas. Hashtag savings. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. The Pirates and Cardinals have the best two records in baseball, and they go head-to-head one final time this regular season. Could this be a preview of next week's division series? Coverage begins Wednesday at 6.30 Eastern on ESPN Radio.